And joining us now on the debate in Washington, D.C., William Klein, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And with us here in studio, Joshua Mendelson, Chief Economist with Mendelson Global Economics. Monmohan Agarwal, Senior Visiting Fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation. And Brian Milner, Senior Economics Writer and Global Markets Columnist at The Globe and Mail. Uh, it's good to have everybody here in our studio. And Bill Klein, nice to have you on the line from Washington, D.C. We essentially Thank want you. to do two things tonight. We're taking a look at two features of globalization, the free flow of currency and the free flow of labor, which some argue, both of which undermine national sovereignty. So well, let's start with the latest villain in this drama, and that is the bond markets. And to that end, I'm going to urge all of you just to get comfortable for a second, because we're going to play a minute and a half of tape here to set up the discussion that is to come. So Michael, if you would, roll tape. Can you pin down exactly what would keep investors happy, make them feel more confident? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, personally, uh, it doesn't matter. That, that's, see, I'm a trader. Uh, I don't really care about that kind of stuff. I go with what the, uh, I, if I see an opportunity to make money, I go with that. Um, so for most traders, it's not about, it's that we don't really care that much how they're going to fix the, how they're going to fix the economy, how they're going to fix the, uh, the whole situation. Our job is to make money from it. And personally, I've been dreaming of this moment for three years. Uh, I, I, I have a confession, which is uh, I go to bed every night, I dream of another recession. I dream of another moment like this. Why? Because uh, people don't seem to uh, maybe remember, but uh, the 30s depression, the depression in the 30s, wasn't just about a market crash. There were some people who were prepared to make money from that crash. And I think anybody can do that. It, it isn't just for some people in the elite. Anybody can actually make money. It's an opportunity. If you could see the people around me, jaws have collectively dropped at what you've just said. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we appreciate your candor. However, it doesn't help the rest of us, does it, or the rest of the Eurozone? I, I would say this. Listen. I would say this to everybody who's watching this. This economic crisis is like a cancer. If you just wait and wait thinking this is going to go away, just like a cancer, it's going to grow and it's going to be too late. What I would say to everybody is get prepared. Uh, this is not a time right now to um, wishful thinking the government is going to sort things out. The governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. Okay, let's start from there. Joshua, what do you think? Well, the comments made by the speaker su doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's the attitude of a desk trader. Uh, to say that governments don't rule the world, it is true up to a point. Uh, capital flows and, and goods flows and, uh, and, and resources do have a greater influence today. But at the end of the day, we can't forget one thing. Governments still make the rules of what applies within their borders. Governments kill, can still apply constraints and can still make life more difficult for the others. What if they're bought and paid for by the Goldman Sachs of the world, as this when gentleman seems to suggest? When you say they're bought and paid for, what exactly do you mean? Well, are you saying that, they're, that, the, that the officials are, in fact, uh, in the pockets of Goldman Sachs, or is it that they rely on funds coming in from investment banks and others? I would say that, that there are people occupying parks all over this world right. because they believe that the Wall Streets, the Bay Streets, the whatever streets of this world give money to politicians who then make the rules based on what those people who gave the money want. I think that's, uh, that's to some extent may be true. In the case of Greece, there's the question of how much was hidden and how much was uh, 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 done with, uh, with the investment bankers in terms of hiding the debt, the debt situation. Uh, and that's a rather cynical view of the world. And uh, I, I, Is it incorrect? I'm not sure if it's totally incorrect, but I don't think I would generalize it around, you know, around the world. I mean, you've got a number of people who are, in fact, Goldman Sachs alumni who are doing some of the better things in this financial environment. Look at Mark Carney and the role that he's going to be playing and has played in Canada, but going to be playing on the, on the global stage in terms of setting the guidelines and the rules and the constraints on the financial system. So I, I think um, there are responsible people, and uh, to simply take the view of the trader as sort of the, the image of what this whole system is all about, I think is, is being uh, very, very cynical. Okay, Brian, let's go back to the tape. The attitude that was displayed by that desk trader in that interview on the BBC. Your thoughts? Well, traders are generally crazy to begin with. <laughs> uh, some of them are clinically insane. Uh, this, this particular trader is a day trader who works for himself, so he probably has lots of time to 
dream of all kinds of things. He doesn't work for an institution, but had he worked for Lehman Brothers in 2008, I doubt if he'd have this attitude that Lehman rules the world because <laughs> uh, they disappeared. Uh, but, but the argument that, that there is a corporatization of politics, I think, is a legitimate argument. You see it in the States, not so much because Goldman appointees are running Washington, but because the costs of running campaigns are so enormous now, and a lot of money flows from Wall Street into the pockets of those politicians. And that's true of Obama, just as it's true of the Republicans. Mohan, what did you think of the candor displayed in that interview? Well, he was very candid, but the point is that in reality, you don't get that everybody can make money. Yes, some people made money in the 1930s, but a lot of people lost a lot of money. So to say that anybody can make money is, I think, very simplistic. Secondly, it's not really true that the Goldman Sachs rule the world. As was said earlier, it's the governments that make the rules. The government can prohibit the sale of alcohol, and it has one effect. It can allow the sale of alcohol. It has another effect. The government can tomorrow decriminalize cocaine and have a different effect. So it is the governments which make the rules and allow the private individuals to operate and make profits or losses. Bill Klein, your thought on that video. Well, first of all, it was made at the end of September. And if he was hedged for the collapse of the stock market, he lost a ton of money in October, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, secondly, I think the momentum aspects of the market do clarify why we are particularly worried about Italy right now. Once you get um, a snowball building where the markets say, well, this is the direction it's going to go, and we're going to keep uh, charging in that direction, you can get self-fulfilling prophecies and turn a solvent country into an insolvent country. Because it, at 10% interest, Italy is insolvent. At 5% uh, interest, it's perfectly solvent. Uh, I realize that there is uh, a, a terrific conventional wisdom nowadays, Joshua, that, to suggest that the bond markets and the bond traders are all, you know, the personification of evil in the world today, and that the world is in crisis because of them. But there is another side of the argument, which is that the bond markets perform an important and valuable function. Do you want to remind us of what that is? Well, that function really is to look at the riskiness of investments, to look at the, at the risk versus the return, to look at, the, at, uh, at all the issues facing the, the issuer, uh, and make a decision on whether it is a, va a valid investment or a good investment. And by taking a negative view, they in fact, uh, you know, under normal circumstances, and in most cases, they in fact bring to bear the pressures that for some change, necessary change, as the case may be. It's often been said of short, short sellers. They identify uh, problems in a company sometimes early on, and, such as sign of forest, and bring it to, to the forefront and accelerate the adjustment process. Now, there is a cost to this. If, sometimes if you allow a little bit of t more time, uh, the problem will correct itself. And if you force the issue, sometimes you end up on the wrong side of that transaction. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that the, the bond markers per se are evil in, this, in the sense that it's a process. It's a market. Uh, it's, and, and they trade with supply and demand. Uh, and uh, the, the problem occurs when you get um, the bandwagon effect that seems to be happening with Italy, has happened with Greece, uh, that everybody jumps in and sells. Uh, and there, there becomes a time when they start testing the, the official authorities, if you will, whether it's, the, whether it's the central banks or the ECB and what have you, and how far will you go? Just the same as Soros did with the British pound in the early 90s. George Soros, yeah. Uh, Brian, yeah. do you think that they're the personification of evil in this world today, as some would allege? <laughs> I'm not even sure that the, the, this term bond vigilante is, is real. I don't believe there are vigilantes out there hunting for these, these uh, dead-in-the-water governments and saying, mm -hmm. oh, we've got to attack their bonds. I think uh, what, what is happening is that they, they perceive a certain amount of risk and they demand to be paid for care taking that risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, if you can do credit default swaps, which are basically insurance on your bond purchases, and you think that those will be honored, then you can afford to take less risk because you're insured. What's happened in the last couple of weeks is that the International Swaps Association is saying that the, the cuts demanded by the Europeans uh, for bank holders of debt, 50 percent cuts, they call it voluntary with quote marks around <laughs> it while the ISDA has determined that those cuts don't constitute a default event. That's the term they use. Therefore, you can't cash in your swap. Well, if you can't cash that in and it's worthless, and you're sitting with Italian debt, you're going to demand 
the difference to hold that risk. So if you're paying 4.5% just to get insurance, you're going to, you're going to try to get it in the market. So or guess, you're not going to buy the bonds. So the suggestion is that we should stop blaming the bond markets and start, start, maybe start blaming the people who were uh, you know, recklessly borrowing this money to, be, to begin with? Or the insurers who don't really want to honor the, uh, the claims. Hmm. Bill, where are you putting, uh, of that equation I just put forward, where are you putting the preponderance of the blame? Well, on the specific thing of the, uh, the swaps, I do think that it, the test will be whether, in fact, the only people who come to sign up for this 50% cut in Greece uh, are the, the, the banks and the sort of the big players. And the little guys truly can get out on a voluntary basis. Then I think the decision to call it uh, a non-event uh, is right. It, it's a group of people who have very special interests. The Greek banks hold a lot of this. They've got very special uh, interests. But on the broader question of who's to blame, the, the markets or the governments, I mean, I think the, the Greek situation clearly uh, was one of excessive deficits and excessive debt. Uh, the Italian is much more uh, ambiguous. What has become uh, a cardinal sin, uh, it seems, is to have a high debt to GDP ratio. Now, the only uh, honorary exemption from this is Japan, which has an even higher debt to GDP ratio than Italy. But Italy's uh, fiscal deficits uh, were not all that large, and it's, it had some structural problems. It wasn't growing fast enough. Uh, we will see whether some of the structural changes they're making are going to, to speed that up. But it is amazing how just the nominal value of the debt uh, has become um, increasingly uh, uh, inflammatory, and, and that is, a, a, is something that the United States needs to keep in mind as well. Hmm. Mohan, I do not mean this as a facetious question. I set it up that way. But I do want to tackle the last thing that that bond trader said, that day trader, in uh, that BBC interview, where he said Goldman Sachs is basically running the show these days. Do you think Goldman Sachs is more powerful than many countries in this world today? I think that's always been true. The financial institutions have always been more powerful than the smaller countries. That was as true in the 19th century when Latin American countries were borrowing from the London stock market. Okay, how about not Equatorial Guinea? How about Canada? Is, is Goldman Sachs more powerful than Canada? I think it's not more powerful than the larger countries. I think, for instance, Goldman Sachs was almost going bankrupt, and the US government had not bailed it out. It was gone, just like Lehman Brothers went, and some of the other large financial companies went. So I think governments are very powerful. When they choose to act, the governments could have put conditions on the financial sector for the bailout, as they put conditions on the auto sector. But that requires a level of, um, that requires a, a level of political leadership that I, I suspect many would argue we have not seen. What do you think? I think more than the level of political leadership, it is the advice that the political leaders are getting from the major international institutions, like the IMF, like the ECB, like the BIS, and so on. For instance, over the last two years, all of these institutions have been telling governments to cut their deficit to raise taxes, cut expenditure, the effect is going to be contractionary. And we know that in a contractionary situation, there is no way that the debt GDP ratio is going to improve. The politicians are not economists. They have followed the advice of the major economic international institutions, and they've gotten into this mess. So if you're a politician today, you're going to wonder, who do I listen to? Hmm. Joshua, is Goldman Sachs more powerful than Canada? No, I don't think it is. I think there is still enough power in here to do things. The issue you raise is, uh, and you said it early on, to the extent that Goldman Sachs, particularly in the U.S., I think Brian made that point, where they, they provide funds for uh, politicians and the like so that they influence decisions. And certainly that does happen, and that's part of the process. Uh, but I think at the, at the end of the day, uh, Canada has actually performed reasonably well and has, uh, and has done so by making its own choices. In fact, it, it, yes, it, it raised the deficit for a period uh, to, uh, to help us uh, stay out of, out, of the, out of the ditch, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we still fell into it to some degree, but we've recovered quite quickly. Uh, but no, I, I, don't think, I don't think they are. Uh, well, let me ask Brian. I, I, you know, it seems it goes without saying that Goldman Sachs is more powerful than many smaller countries in the world. Canada's a G8 country. Is Goldman Sachs more powerful 
than Canada? No, I, I don't believe so. And I think the key reason why is that Canada has an independent central bank and an independent monetary policy. Uh, for instance, when going back to George Soros and his famous attack on the British pound, the only reason he defeated the British government is that the Bank of England set a limit on how much it would spend defending the pound. Mm -hmm. If you're a central bank and you say, there is no limit on what I will spend to defend my currency, Goldman Sachs and the rest of the market cannot win. They cannot outspend a central bank that ha controls the printing of money. Hmm. Uh, the problem in Europe right now is that the European Central Bank won't make those sorts of commitments and can't, probably legally. That forces them to scramble the way they are and, and causes these runs. Although I heard today that it's not a run on Italian banks, it's a walk on Italian <laughs> banks. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that's been going on. But in Canada, the Bank of Canada can defeat any such attack if it wants to. Well, Bill Klein, one of the things that that clip showed very clearly was that there doesn't appear to be a great deal of morality in the way that some people make their decisions on the markets. And my question is, should we expect them to be moral in the way they do their jobs? Well, you know, Adam Smith uh, tried to argue uh, that it was each individual acting in his own interests that together in a market economy brought the best general good. And I think that truth is basically remains true. I do think that if you read the accounts of the subprime ex experience and the conflicts of interest of some of the folks who were rating the subprime uh, collateralized uh, instruments, uh, you begin to wonder about ethics. But even there, those folks who were rating them said, well, you know, housing prices always go up or stay flat. So this is not really risky. Mm -hmm. My sense is that the bulk of uh, the financial sector uh, behaves in certainly uh, ways that they feel are, are uh, consistent with the law, ethical. You have some extreme exceptions, uh, the, the Ponzi scheme uh, you know, Mr. Madoff and, and a few like him. But the uh, basic question has more to do with the uh, fluctuations of the market, the question of leverage. I think we've had a major deleveraging of uh, this industry since the great crisis. You know, after all, Goldman Sachs and, uh, used to be much more heavily leveraged. They became a bank with uh, much higher capital requirements. Uh, so. The problems, I think, have much more to do with uh, calculations and bets that are placed uh, and not with a, a class of immoral um, actors. Understood. OK, we mentioned off the top that we were going to take a look at the free flow of currency and the free flow of labor. And now let's do the second of those, the free flow of labor. The New America Foundation came out with a paper last month called The Way Forward. And here is how the New York Times' Joe Nocera talked about that. Michael, if you would, this graphic. This time. It really is different. What Dan Alpert and his co-authors mean by that is that the bursting of the debt bubble three years ago was not just a severe example of the ups and downs that are an inevitable part of American capitalism. Rather, it was the ultimate consequence of the modern global economy. Chief among the changes that have taken place is the integration of China, Russia, and India, and other countries into the global economic mainstream. The developed world once had maybe 500 million workers. Today, say the authors, we've added another 2 billion people to the global workforce. That change alone has had a great deal to do with the stagnant wages, income inequality, and the oversupply of labor in America that was masked by rising home prices and access to credit. The bursting of the bubble exposed how much the American economy depended on cheap credit. Now that the curtain has been pulled back, cheap credit alone can't fix our problems. The country is in a deflationary cycle that is very difficult to get out of. As wages decrease or more workers become unemployed, people become afraid to spend. Assets like homes drop in value. Businesses react by lowering prices and laying off yet more workers, which only triggers a new round of deflation. The only thing that doesn't change is the unsustainably high debt that was accrued during the bubble. OK, Brian, is he on to something? What do you think? Well, I think his comments on, on, on the debt issue are, are dead on. I think that's exactly what's going on. And I think when people are fearful, they don't spend. And, and consumer spending in the U.S. economy is critical to its growth because it accounts for so much of the, of the economy, unlike some others, which depend on more on exports or on business uh, 
business development. So if you can't get the consumer to spend, you're not going to have much growth in the United States economy. Mohan, is he right that with two billion more people in the labor market, that's a, you know, as good an explanation as any for why unemployment is so persistently high? No, I don't think so. I think the problem is not the additional labor force from China, India, or wherever. I think the problem has been technological change, which has made labor redundant, as machines have substituted for labor. And I think the same problem arises in these emerging economies. For instance, if you look at China, generally over time, as economies grow, as they become richer, you shed labor force from the agricultural sector into the industrial sector and then into the services sector. Now, if you look at China, there is hardly much labor going out of agriculture. China has much more labor in agriculture than is typical of an economy with its level of income. And that is true for the other large economies in Asia also, India, Indonesia, and so on. So even if China, with its tremendous rate of manufacturing, cannot generate enough jobs in manufacturing to reduce the amount of labor in agriculture as rapidly as other countries have done in the past, problem of employment is, I think, a universal problem and not something which affects the developed countries alone. Okay, but Joshua, the suggestion here also seems to be what, we're, what we have been undergoing for the past three years is more than just your typical cyclical downturn. There are kind of, uh, the suggestion here is almost unprecedented, extraordinary uh, effects that are also in play. Is that right? Well, I, I think Dan Alpert has a point in that because you've got uh, alternative sources of labor supply, at much cheaper rates that you do through the supply chains and through shifting of production uh, locations that you can move and you have moved production uh, to cheaper cost countries and even China because of the rising wage rate is moving production uh, to other Southeast Asian countries which are lower cost. And so that does compete with a certain category of worker who may not have the technical skills to move up the ladder or for industries that have basically shifted offshore. And it happened very quickly. And it does happen fairly quickly because the companies look at their at their bottom line and they say if we can do it here and we and we have a certain degree of political security if you want to call it that I'm not sure how much you can have in China but you have that then then they will move. The 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 challenge I think in in the in countries like the US is that there hasn't been enough done on the educational system and related areas to develop and build up the the nature of the labor force particularly at the lower and middle uh, rungs uh, to take on the more advanced positions which naturally will gravitate to lower cost uh, to lower cost locations. Bill Klein all of what we have said so far and we hear we hear this every day of our lives that governments are doing absolutely everything that they can to help create jobs and I want to put that to you and have you tell us whether you believe that that's actually true are governments pushing every lever they possibly can to create the jobs for those two billion more people who are now in the labor force well my sense is that the two billion more people in the labor force is basically a red herring uh, there's no way you can attribute the U.S. housing bubble to China signing on to the WTO. It just doesn't track. Uh, Alan Greenspan's interest rate uh, policy had much more to do with it uh, than the opening of the international economy to a lot more workers. Uh, the failure of manufacturing jobs to keep up with the economy uh, should not be blamed on China nearly so much as should be attributed to technical change. We saw, as, as uh, Mon, Mon was saying, we've seen the same thing in agriculture. And so you get a shifting of the labor force into um, other areas, uh, services sector. And it's important to keep in mind that the availability of international workers producing cheap imports for us reduces the real cost of goods. And so the real income of the workers, including those who purchase apparel, uh, and that's a fairly high percentage of the family budget in low-income uh, families, uh, that their standard of living is higher than it, than it would be. So what we are in the middle of has, I think, uh, much more to do with the severity of a financial crash recession uh, as compared with the run-of-the-mill recession. You can't solve this kind of a recession by simply reducing the interest rate. Most recessions are caused by high inflation. The Fed cranks up the interest rate. When you get the recession, they simply crank it back down. That's not our situation. We have zero interest. Can mm -hmm. we do more? I think we can do more on infrastructure spending. Um, 
I think we can probably do more to try to turn around the housing market. There are various uh, proposals. And I think we can do a lot more in terms of making it clear that 10 to 15 years from now, we will not be running huge deficits. And breaking out of this political impasse where there's an absolute phobia about revenue on the one side uh, and um, a lack of discretionary spending that you can cut uh, to, to deal with that. So if we can get a realistic dialogue on our long-term fiscal problems and make sure that in the next year or so, we don't shoot ourselves in the foot by having severe fiscal contraction, then we can gradually come out of one of these most severe uh, recessions, namely a financial crash recession. Brian, you want to come back on that? Well, well, first of all, I really don't think governments are doing all they can to promote job growth. And we they see say that, they are. Every day they say they are. They do. Uh, but you see that, especially in the United States, where it can be argued very forcefully that, that their, their spending uh, was not enough and they pulled it too soon. Uh, they, they didn't develop clear major infrastructure plans, which we know their infrastructure is falling apart. They could devote billions to rebuilding it, and there are a lot of jobs that would be involved in that. Uh, and, and on the education side, as Josh was saying, they must fix the education model. They're not training people for the jobs that they already have, and as, including the knowledge economy. We've been hearing about the knowledge economy for 20 years. Everybody's watched manufacturing jobs disappear from developed countries over the last 30 years. Uh, and I can tell you that some of that is just because of technology. Caterpillar manufactures tractors in, in Illinois. They still do. Uh, but they used to use 5,000 workers at a plant to make those tractors, and they can make the same amount now with 500. Hmm. We started this program by talking about whether or not countries were uh, less sovereign um, today than they used to be. That seems pretty apparent. And Joshua, I want to follow up with you on that. More countries are participating in the global economy than ever before. They have given up some of the tools that allowed them to make independent decisions, joining international organizations, the European Union, and so on. We, the thinking was, I think, yes, we will give up some of that sovereignty because it'll improve our economic circumstances and the world will be smaller and we'll do better. It doesn't appear to have turned out that way. Was it worth giving up the sovereignty? Well, the issue is, for example, with the euro. You've given up sovereignty in certain areas, but you've retained sovereignty in others. That is, you've retained the fiscal sovereignty, but not, but the, you've monetary. Given, but not the monetary. And so you, want, you have only one policy lever to deal with more than one problem. This is a classic issue in economics. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing when I go back to the Asian financial crisis in 97, uh, 98. Uh, they uh, deregulated their financial systems to allow capital to come in, but they didn't de deregulate or didn't ease, uh, change the, the guidelines of or the, the operating rules, if you will, of how the capital was going to be redistributed within the country once it, once it came in. So you had, uh, so you had bubbles forming there. Uh, so I think, yes, in principle, they, they had the, the notion was, was, was right, but the way they did it was only, was only half-baked. And that's why you have a lot, of, a lot of arguments right now is if the, euro, if the euro is to survive, you need to have a centralized fiscal uh, body. I'm not sure if many of the countries, particularly the smaller ones, are going to be prepared uh, to give up that and may, in fact, pull out of the euro simply to regain some semblance of, of, uh, of, in, of uh, freedom to act, even though the cost of doing so, at least for a, for a period, could be quite substantial. Well, Mohan, let's go back then. Twenty years ago, there were people, you know, burning down buildings in the streets of Seattle saying this increasing globalization and this increasing giving up of national sovereignty to these supranational organizations is in the end going to be a bad thing. Were they right? Yes and no. I mean, to a certain extent, that's what's happened. But it's partly because of the design of the international organizations. For instance, the ECB refuses to act as a lender of last resort. And we've known that throughout history, central banks have acted as the lenders of last resort. And in fact, Acting as a lender of last resort came before central banks started using monetary policy. It was the largest private banks which started acting as lenders of last resort, whether it was the Bank of England in the middle 19th century or J.P. Morgan. goes back to the Spanish in, in 1500s. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, if you have an institution which refuses to act as the institution it is supposed to act, then you're going to have a problem. Similarly with the IMF, the IMF was created to provide more stability to countries in balance of payments problems. 
but the conditions it has imposed on these countries have created problems. And therefore, countries resist going to the IMF and build up these huge reserves, which creates imbalances. So I think what we need is not that the giving up of sovereignty was bad, but you need a more balanced institutional framework to manage the economies. Were those folks right in the streets of Seattle 20 years ago, Brian? No, I, I don't think they, they were. And I, I think that the, the dangers of globalization have been overplayed. Uh, uh, first of all, it's, uh, globalization hasn't really arrived in, in some areas yet. Uh, we still have, we don't have the labor mobility that you were speaking of earlier. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to move around Europe. You, you tell Greek workers that there are jobs in Germany and then see A, if they want to move, and, and B, if the Germans want them. Mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't happened. Plus, uh, if you look at, uh, at global investment patterns, most global investment, most investors still stay at home. They don't move abroad in huge numbers. It's only about a third uh, of the money that does. Uh, and, uh, and those markets are still developing. Plus, globalization has reduced costs to the poorest countries in the world for all kinds of things, including food, and it's enabled them to develop industries that they wouldn't have been able to develop when there were high tariff walls everywhere. Got hooked on cheap food, though, which means when the prices go up, there are riots in the streets. Well, that's because the governments were subsidizing the prices and, lure, and lulling them into this belief that it would always stay cheap. <laughs> okay, let's do uh, the final segment. How are we doing on time here, Larry? I think we're about less than 10 minutes to go here. So with that in mind, Michael, would you bring up this uh, Venn diagram as it is? And there are, <laughs> you know that these circles are supposed to intersect. Uh, here on the one hand, things that are considered politically feasible and then things that might actually work. And in the best of all worlds, you know, these circles are on top of each other. But they are pretty far apart in that picture, which suggests that that which we want to do and that's what, that which we can do uh, seem to be poles apart these days. Why is it, uh, Bill Klein, to you first, why, why does it seem so difficult in the world today when pe so many people seem to think they know what needs to be done, getting that done? Well, I think in the United States, we have the particular problem of the polarization uh, of, the, of the political parties. There's much less of a sense than there used to be uh, of cooperation and, and horse trading uh, to get a problem uh, solved. Uh, I also think it's fair to say that um, the solutions are not as obvious uh, as they are to a more normal uh, recession. Uh, when you do worry about escalating debt, uh, then you think twice about uh, just how much fiscal stimulus uh, you apply. I think you can make a case, as was made before, that we didn't do enough. But you have one eye on the uh, concerns of uh, eventual excessive debt. Um, so it's, I'm not sure it's quite so true that we have exactly the solutions that everybody agrees, and it's just that the politicians uh, can't agree. Well, I've heard, Joshua, I've heard Paul Martin sit in that chair just a few weeks ago saying it's pretty apparent we need to create some kind of European bond that will enable that mess to get, you know, at least start to get down the road to resolving it. There don't seem to be any efforts undertaken right now in Europe to make that happen. So, again, it comes back to the question. A lot of people think they know what needs to be done, but getting there seems to be impossible. How come? Well, something was said early on in the program where the notion was that if the ECB were to underwrite or to agree to be the lender of last resort and buy up all the Italian bonds up to a certain interest rate mm -hmm. level, it would flush out the, uh, the, the bond vigilantes, if you want to call yes. them that. Uh, the, the Germans are obviously against that, very strongly so, because of their history with hyperinflation. Uh, what Germany also needs to admit, though, is the existence of the euro has served it very well because it's kept what would have been the Deutschmark much lower than otherwise and given it a competitive advantage. So there are areas where both culture and political polarization, as was just noted in the United States, are preventing certain things from taking place that would be helpful. They won't necessarily be the, 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 fin the final answer. The final answer really relies on... Uh, not that I think I, I have all the solutions here, but for example, in the U.S., yes, there needs to be a major stimulus measure, uh, effort over the short term with a written in the stone guarantee of debt deficit and debt reduction over the longer term that will be adhered to and not changed by the next Congress, so to speak. That 
idea is dead on arrival in the U.S. Congress today. That's the problem because of the polarization. Okay. Do you worry, Mullen, that um, we're going to see a backlash to uh, increasing liberalization, free trade agreements, that kind of thing? Is that coming? I don't think so. I mean, if anything is possible if things get bad enough. But I think it's very unlikely because in contrast to the 30s, you have two situations. One, countries have signed on to the WTO agreements where tariffs are bound. Mm. So they can't very easily raise tariffs. The second is that you have multilateralization of production and supply chains. So corporations today would not want trade to be disrupted because that would completely disrupt their production chains. As you've seen, even floods in Thailand disrupts production. Mm. So I think because of these changes in the features of the world economy, I don't expect protection to become much serious. That's what corporations want, Brian. But uh, we've tried to establish, I think, on this program that countries are still calling the shots <laughs> to, to, to a certain extent, uh, putting up trade barriers, well, protecting the home industries. And what do you think? Th that tends to happen when yeah. things get really bad. And, and we can say all we want, uh, oh, on paper, that's a terrible thing to do. But when you're a politician and people are suffering, it's really easy to blame the outsider for the problem. And, uh, and if, uh, if becoming more protectionist, and that's a tradition in the United States in tough times, uh, if that gets you votes and keeps people from screaming and you know, marching around the White House, and that could well happen again. Uh, we have to remember that as recently as 2009, they decided to protect American tire production, and they put on these, these uh, this, they set up a pretty good trade barrier. It cost them a fortune to do it. Uh, one economist estimated that it cost about $140,000 for each job saved every year hmm. to do this. Uh, and that's the kind of cost that governments need to look at. But when times get tough, that's what they tend to do. Bill, it does seem very tempting that every time the United States wants to go through one of its nationalistic orgies of America first, um, they say, buy America first, Canada that doesn't include you, and it doesn't matter the fact that our two economies are so utterly integrated that it's almost cutting off your nose to spite your face. You want to figure that out for us? I mean, I think that it's vastly exaggerated any notion that there was this huge outbreak of protection. On the contrary, I think for the worst uh, global recession since the 1930s, there was remarkably little uh, protection that occurred. Yes, some of the additional spending had a, you know, binational clause, but we do have the WTO, we do have the rules that we've agreed to, and we ha it's not a question of giving up sovereignty, it's a question of a quid pro quo bargain. Uh, I agree to keep my market open because I know that you've agreed to keep your market open. The WTO dispute settlement process has worked extremely effectively. So, so far there has been very little, to my viewpoint, outbreak of protection in view of uh, the severe declines in employment and high unemployment uh, levels. And I guess I basically expect that to continue. Is there going to be some surcharge against uh, a subsidized uh, uh, Chinese currency? Well, maybe that's a little more likely, but maybe that's a little bit something of a practice that ought to have its knuckles wrapped. So I, I see it a little bit differently from this uh, specter of imminent protection. In our last minute here, Mohan, does the idea that the global market is now so vast and so uncontrollable that, in a sense, it lets politicians off the hook because it's out of their hands? Again, I think you know, politicians grapple with the problem and try to get to grips with it. One way is to have more cooperative agreements. Like the euro was a way to grapple with the large size of things. So the idea was that if all these countries got together in the euro, they could more easily manage their financial relations than if they were separate. So governments do try to get to grips with problems in their own way. And as the world economy gets larger and the financial players become larger, countries also cooperate more. I mean, there are many more meetings among countries, whether it's Brazil, South Africa, India, or India and China, to try to manage the economies. Well, I've appreciated the cooperation both at this table and on our satellite feed to Washington, D.C. today for our discussion. Bill Klein, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Thanks.
for being on the line from Washington, D.C. Yeah. for us. Back here in our studios, Joshua Mendelson, Chief Economist, Mendelson Global Economics. Manmohan Agarwal, Senior Visiting Fellow from CG. Thank you for coming all the way from Delhi just to do this program. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Okay, maybe not. And Brian Milner, Senior Economics Writer and Global Markets Columnist at the Globe and Mail. Brian, thanks uh, for your participation My as pleasure. well. I came all the way from St. Clair and Bathurst. And you <laughs> made it safe and sound. We're glad about that.